All right. So we made it to Revelation chapter 14. Uh, still in the interlude, uh, the bowls begin in 15. So, uh, but we're very near the end, very near the time of pouring out of the bowls. So there's definitely a lot going on. And the way that prophecy works is a lot of times they're speaking as if they were in the middle of it already or as if it's already happened. The present tense future <laughs> somehow. I'm not even not a language expert, but apparently that has something to do with the way that a prophet can speak about events that are about to occur as if they are occurring already. All right. Uh, we usually read through the entire chapter because there is a blessing on us just for doing that. Um, we're so grateful that that blessing exists. So um, I don't know how much wind you got in your sails tonight, Joe. Let me know if you can. If you can. I think I can billow it out. <laughs> All right. Then I looked, and this is what I saw. The Lamb stood firmly established on Mount Zion, and with him 140,000 who had his name and his father's name inscribed on their foreheads, signifying God's own possession. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of a great waters and like the rumbling of mighty thunder, and the voice that I heard seemed like music and was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne of God and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one else could learn the song except the 140,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled by relations with women, for they are celibate. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased and redeemed from among men of Israel as the first fruits sanctified and set apart for special service for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to preach in the to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation and tribe and lang language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God with awe and reverence, and give him glory and honor and praise and worship, because the hour of his judgment has come. With all your heart, worship him who created the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, this, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her immor Im immorality. I almost said immortality. Immorality, corrupting them with idolatry. Then another angel, a third one, followed them saying with a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast in his image and receives the mark of the beast on his forehead or in his hand, he too will have to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, mixed undiluted into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is encouragement for the steadfast endurance of the saints, those who habitually keep God's commandments and their faith in Jesus. Then I heard the distinct words of a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, so that they may rest and have relief from their labors, for their deeds do follow them. Again, I looked, and this is what I saw, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle of swift judgment in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who was sitting upon the cloud, put in your sickle and reap at once, for the hour to reap in judgment has arrived, because the earth's harvest is fully ripened. So he who was sitting on the cloud cast a sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar, the one who has the power over fire, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and reap the clusters or grapes from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe for judgment. 
So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and harvested the grapevine of the earth and threw the grapes into the grape, great winepress of the wrath and indignation of God as judgment for the rebellious world. And the grapes in the winepress were trampled and crushed outside the city and blood poured from the winepress, reaching up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Thank you, Joe. Definitely two separate visions there going on. Then I looked and behold in verse 1. Then I looked and behold in verse 14. Um, definitely a lot to just look at, go through. I didn't finish the uh, verses and the references to the verses in the uh, writings, the law and the prophets, what we sometimes call the Old Testament. There were quite a few and it was taking a while, so <laughs> I didn't quite get there this week. Holidays. You will be judged. Uh, you will be judged. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I expect that. Among friends. Then I looked, and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. So Mount Zion, typically that's going to be a place of refuge, a place of victory, a place of rulership. So all those images would be uh, brought to the mind of any person who's uh, been reading all the books that led up to this book up till now. Um, refuge, safety, rulership, they would all be included in the term Mount Zion. Um, when you combine both Mount and Zion, it really does. Uh, it's positive. It's uh, it's not an actual place? Yeah, it is an actual place, yeah. The, the side of the mountain in Israel with the uh, temple on it. My, how am I doing, Phil? Is that correct? Yes, the holy mountain. There's only one holy mountain. There you go. An actual place. Yes. And not only an actual place, but what I was emphasizing is it's uh, as an actual place the throne of a place of rulership and um, refuge and it's used by God as a symbol as a, in addition to being a place mm -hmm. and with him were 144,000 we've seen them before but we're getting a little more information on them now but they are a redeemed group of people to me I would take them to be literal I don't I don't I don't think it's uh a point of contention if you don't but it, it would seem to me to be a literal thing in this case um, sort of a first fruits company a company of hey 12 times 12 144 take that out to the thousands and just be amazed at God's faithfulness to Israel and these are people he redeemed so they're people I would say, just by looking at that wording. Um, so the fact that they have no lie found in their mouth and they're blameless, that could be God's uh, amazing ability to rewrite our story like he does in Hebrews with Abraham, how Abraham believed and never doubted and all this other. And If you actually read the story, you're thinking, well, it looks like he did right there, but... When God writes our story, he takes it from the perspective of everything that he covered over and forgave us for. And it becomes a much more uh, cleaned up story at that point because, wow, he, he's covered it all. So, so I, I could see that being a very real thing going on there. I was talking earlier in the week to a friend and I was like, I don't even know how how to describe and John's doing his best, but the voice from heaven sounds like rushing water, loud thunder and harps. <laughs> it's like, whoo, OK. Uh, an overwhelming sound, to say the least, and a, a combination of very loud things i mean rushing water i've stood next to niagara falls that's pretty loud booming thunder that's pretty loud 
I have never been in the presence of many harpists playing on their harps, but I'm sure that would have almost a comforting sound to it, actually. They get to sing a new song. There's many references to a new song. Typically, it's a time of victory when a new song is being sung. So continuing that theme, um, it's, a, it's a time of victory, and they're proclaiming a victory. This 144,000 company, I don't actually see anywhere where it really says what they do. A lot of people have a lot of assumptions. But other than being there and worshiping it, is, am I missing something? Does somebody else see that? Like, they sing, they worship, they're there. And they follow the Lamb. And they follow the Lamb. Yes. Yeah, it says they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. <laughs> okay. Redeemed from among mankind as first fruits for God and for the Lamb. First fruits speaking of here's what's happened so far, and it's a guarantee that it's going to keep happening because when you have the harvest, the first fruits come, you give them back to the Lord saying, Thank you that they're here, and we know you're going to keep providing. So you you actually return the first fruits to God. As an acknowledgement that he's the one who, you know, made them happen and he would be the one who's going to continue making them happen. We don't have to cling to these. We'll turn them back to you and say thank you for this and thank you for what will now continue because you're faithful and true. So it's always a good reminder in first fruits of the goodness of God and faithfulness of God. Amen. My question is, what are they singing? Right? Because they're not allowed to sing this song, right? <laughs> there's a reference in the... We're not allowed to learn it. In chapter 15, there's a reference to those that sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And so they're singing uh, of the Redeemer, and uh, it's like uh, the song of Moses in Deuteronomy. And also the song of the of the Lamb, Messiah. Yeah, we are given lyrics in verse in chapter fifteen to a song, but we're told here that no one is able to learn the song. I don't know about that. I like the fact though That's that. Song. Yeah, I like the fact that there are things. That we don't know you know what did the seven thunder say it's not for you to know yet you know it, humans get annoyed by stuff like that but i think it's good for us to be aware that there are certain things reserved for certain groups or certain times and you just are okay with that god is the one who determined it so it must be right there's something to be said for trusting that he knows what he's doing Um, different translations get it right when they say in verse 6, mid-heaven. It's kind of a neat place where both things in heaven can hear what you're proclaiming and everything below can hear what you're proclaiming. So it's the perfect place to announce and proclaim a message so that every tribe, nation, people, and tongue can hear it and also all the heavenly hosts can hear what's being said too. This is something that we all have to be on the same page for. So he's dispatched into mid heaven to uh, proclaim. And what does he proclaim? It says it's called the message of good news, the gospel. A good news being proclaimed. 
in verse 7. Fear God and give him glory, for the hour has come of his judgment, where he will pass judgment, another version says. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Again and again, we're reminded it's so important to acknowledge the creator made all this. And that's why it's so fought against. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's an incredibly important part of the whole thing. It's part of the everlasting gospel that this angel is being told to proclaim. He's worthy of everything because he's the maker of everything. He's in charge of everything. He determines how it's going to be used in judgment because it's his. It's his to do that with. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. You see, they have to rewrite the physics books now because they looked at that one galaxy that's but 33.8 billion years away or whatever. And it's well formed. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's not supposed to be formed and it, and it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, there'll be more than one rewrite that has to take place <laughs> there eventually, huh? But that, that, blesses me that that's called the message of the good news. His judgment, bringing this evil age to a close, bringing death and hell and the grave and all these things that will not be in the coming kingdom, uh, ushering them in and ushering this out is, uh, is a cause to give him glory. so important to let the spirit of god detach us from having our hope and our sight and our vision in this age and that's what is being proclaimed right there and yeah, most people don't want to be judged and they don't believe that god created this earth right at this point i mean six of the trumpets have been blown a lot has been shown to make it very clear that he that he does and he is um, doing his best to make it clear doing his best to uh, warn and proclaim and get people to come to a place of decision so is this a final last hurrah hey it's coming get get it now while you can kind of thing it seems like that that's happening because the bowls are so severe and so fast one right after the other i would i would agree Joe, that that's uh, I mean the reapers are coming right so right and some people and the, the mark is being offered and things are happening that we've now sped the whole thing up even more so yeah because the bold judgments they they're pretty fast and furious when they start so right it does seem like that doesn't it like the angel is making one last um announcement in hopes of turning and awakening so when the I, I believe it's i don't know where it's at actually now that i think about it but it says not until the gospel is preached over all the earth is that this or is that by us gospel is preached all over the earth yeah, I, I would say yes and yes with that. We are called to do that. 
Case Cheater. No, I can't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> in case we missed somebody. Yeah. We are we are called to and here this this angel is actually <laughs> doing it in any way we might have missed anybody to every nation, tribe, tongue, people. Yeah. He's covering for <laughs> any spot we might have missed. That's right. But the the island off of in uh India that you're not allowed on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You know, nobody. The, the uh the tribes in the amazon that are protected by the government that nobody's allowed to go near that yeah that. they they want to preserve and yeah, yeah. we know it's god is just and fair and true and right so he will have proclaimed it and there will be a, an acknowledgement Verse 8, after the Gospels proclaimed uh, the other side of judgment is definitely being proclaimed there. Babylon, something we're going to be talking about for chapters to come. So we'll have a chance to hash that out eventually. But it is proclaimed that Babylon has fallen. She who made all the nations drink of the wine of the fury of her immorality. Wine makes you unaware of what's going on around you and can lead you to a place where you're not really in your full senses. And I think that's kind of what's being said there. She had ways of doing that. This opposite empire, this opposite understanding or worldview however you want to put it leading people in the wrong direction we definitely have no lack of angels in this chapter that's for sure i saw a uh, commercial or a advertisement for a movie coming out and it's about aliens and uh in the commercial the uh power that comes or whatever they are they can project images in the sky and then they can speak to the entire earth at one time and they're saying something like oh it'll be okay or you know um we have come no to attention to the man behind the curtain i believe yeah there you go but anyways and i just thought you know if somebody sees an angel proclaiming stuff up in the sky right and I think like this kind of stuff sows seeds of like you can't believe it, even if it even if it does actually happen. Right. And there's all kinds of conspiracies about like Project Blue Beam and stuff where they're afraid the our enemies will be able to project things into the sky, holograms and yeah. stuff and, and freak us out or whatever. Right. But I just think it'd be a way that you could of like uh not trusting your own eyes and right. people will be seeing this angel and be proclaiming that god is who he is in the gospel and they might look up and say that's oh, just another one of those right holograms or something yeah you know? yeah so a way that the that satan could deceive us right you know yeah. <laughs> to not even believe our own eyes it's what's happening like with all this deep fake stuff where you can take anybody's image and then their voice and the computer ai makes it look like they're actually speaking these things that how are you ever going to believe it makes it to where you can't believe like anything you see and it's so funny like all these things are going to be proclaimed to these people and i think they're going to be like is it real is this actually happening like they can't even believe what they're actually seeing and i think that that could be one way where somebody could go completely through this whole thing and be like I couldn't trust it in my own eyes, you know? Yeah. Because I don't know if it's real. Right. I think we're going to be like, you know, it says an angel flying. Like, if you read the descriptions of the angels, it doesn't look like any picture of angels I've ever seen. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. there is like TikToks of what if you have an angel that looks like the actual description and stuff, and they're like right. covered in eyes and these huge horns and stuff. And it's like, 
That's not an angel I've ever seen before. Yeah, so maybe they would look up and be like, oh, that's the devil. Right. Because the devil has that goat head horn yeah. thing. And they might look up and say, oh, that must be Satan speaking mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. Like the devil is so clever on how he deceives us. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He's taken over the image of an angel. Even though he, had, well, he did have the image of an angel, right? Right. And yeah, so... I don't know. I'm just interested in that. The other yeah, day, like, yeah. It's, it's got to be 100 percent mercy and show us what's really true and what's not. Yeah, it's going to get weirder and weirder. <laughs> yeah. Leaving out on your own understanding is going to become very important. Like God, what what's true and what's not? Yeah. Lucky for us, we have a instruction book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have the cheat codes up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, B, A. Uh, yeah. And then also, I mean, your ultimate concern is well, where's that power coming from? Because there is going to be displays of power by the false prophet and stuff. It's going to calling down fire and other things like that. But then your, your ultimate question is, well, where's that? Who's that power glorifying? Where did it come from? What's the source? Verse 9 has another angel, a third one, followed these ones, saying in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. So that, that's a key little verse there for continuing to fight the fight against the uh, you can get it by accident or you can get it by without knowing you got it or could be disguised as something else and the next thing you know you have it it's associated with and part of worshiping the beast and his image and receiving a mark on your forehead or your hand so to say do you think chuck that it only the believers are being warned here or do you think the whole world is being warned by the the angel whoever receives the mark of the beast because I think we can draw conclusions that there are those that are left uh, when the Lord returns uh, that have not taken the mark of the beast. And they're, they're going to continue in their natural bodies, and they are going to be ruled over by saints. We're going to rule and reign with Christ when he comes. Who are we going to rule and reign over? Is it not going to be those that are left that did not receive the mark of the beast? Jews and Gentiles? Just yeah, I mean, in the millennium, you're going to have nations who can come up to Israel. So there are people there. And that, that does seem to be um, the delineating factor because... You are going to receive the cup of God's wrath if you've taken the mark. So those who take that warning and don't take the mark. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with what you're saying there. And then come up and eat of the tree of life. Right? So it gives the nations eternal. Mm. Yeah, all that and how that all fits in. Yeah. But they would we're not there yet. <laughs> they would be yeah, they they're willing in the millennial time to come to Israel and, and understand that that's where they're, you know, this is an amazing thing that God has done and he's answered all his promises and followed through on all his um, promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's not one who neglects and is unfaithful. So the nations surrounding come and worship there. So yeah, during the millennial time, there has to be other people around. So it would make sense that they were the ones who refused the mark and understood their, their need to not go in that direction, but maybe didn't. Follow through on going in the other direction. They 
and they just were in between. Receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. Verse 10. He shall also drink the wine of God's fury. Poured full strength. Into the cup of his wrath. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Before the holy angels. And before the lamb. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Those who worship the beast and its image. Those who receive the mark of his name have no rest day or night. You know, Chuck, my translation says they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Sometimes uh, we think about hell as being something away from the presence of God, but here, them being tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb wow that's just something to think of i don't know exactly what the literal trend what the greek says I there. What the literal is yeah and then the other pictures that have it as both darkness and fire and it's definitely not something comprehensible or it's the literal says before the the messengers and before the lamb mm. so i guess in the presence does count that yeah but in the presence doesn't mean um associated with or have any any assistance from Or acknowledgement of you know a lot of that is being spoken though to remind those who follow the lamb the holy ones to persevere you now you what you need to do right now is keep persevering because you don't want what's coming on them so just the clear hey Keep persevering. I know this is hard. This has been hard for a while. It's going to be hard for that period of time. It's actually going to get more intense and get harder coming up. So what I'm proclaiming to you is keep persevering. You're going to get reward from heaven that will be eternal life and good. Keep hanging in there. Keep persevering. Verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, how fortunate are the dead, those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. And again, there's your contrast. Those who follow the beast will get no rest. Those who follow the lamb are actually called fortunate when they die from this point forward as martyrs for the lamb and they are given rest that's what's given to them i think even down here even in this evil age when you're made to go 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 and you just don't get a chance to stop and rest it pretty pretty close to drive you insane we need rest we need times of rest he knows we need times of rest yeah jesus says the what the sabbath is for made for man made for man <laughs> right yeah that's right made for man Just to always need to have that quick reminder. This is a book, a revelation of Jesus Christ. We're seeing a revelation of 
the right way, the only way to bring an evil age to a close and begin a new kingdom afresh and starting. A whole lot of warning and mercy and crying out to just keep persevering that encouragement that we see when we gather with each other and you share with somebody you're going through a hard time that and they share with you they've been through a hard time and we're all just to keep persevering that is a working out of all of this and and it's because we trust in the one who was resurrected from the dead so there is hope the hope of the resurrection paul definitely tells us if we don't have that hope we're the most pitiful of all men on the earth but we do have that hope so this book that reveals Yeshua the Messiah is reminding us dying in this evil age is not the worst thing that can happen to you. If it could happen. If, if it could happen. There is, there is an aspect of being dead that, that, that leads to life, but you didn't actually die on the way. <laughs> Yeah, the amazing life of God. That's that first vision. That's from 1 down to 13. Anything on anybody's heart you want to grab out of that and share with us? It's a comfort to me that you have to know that you're actively choosing and following the beast and his image in order to get this mark. A lot of people use that mark as a fear tactic almost and to drive divisions in situations that really shouldn't have that kind of division, really. So just be aware of that when you see that happening. There's usually a, an agenda behind it. And these verses protect us from that kind of fear-based dividing agenda. And they'll help us to just stay on it, stay in a good place and stay out of that stuff. Definitely grateful for that. Um, clear clear warning and clear words it's not something you're gonna be tricked into it's a choice all right so there's another vision here with a whole lot going on then i looked and behold there was a white cloud Seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. I didn't hear any good argument for this not being Yeshua. The fact that another angel then comes out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud. It's not so much that he's commanding him, it's that he's releasing him, telling him, here, it is time. I just got word from the throne, from God the Father. It is time. Go ahead and put it in your sickle. It's not so much as a command as it is a uh, message from a messenger. So a corporal came up to the sergeant and said, it's time to start the battle. It wouldn't be the corporal was ordering the sergeant. He was just bringing the message from the general to them. So I don't take it as he's being ordered around right there. I think it's Yeshua. And I think this first reaping, and there's definitely plenty of different opinions on this, but this first reaping seems to be a good reaping. Seated on the crown, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. 
and we don't hear anything bad that happened there as a result of that. Now, then, in verse 17, another angel came out from the temple in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had authority over fire, came out from the altar. Now, if we remember the altar, that's where the saints were underneath of the altar, crying out, how long before you um, take care of the fact that we were put to death by all these people? How long before... Um, this is made right where how long before justice takes place in the earth. So coming out from the altar seems to be different from coming out from the temple. And what we're going to see here is coming out from the altar is a definite uh, sickle of judgment. Put in your sickle and gather the grape clusters from the vineyard of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters from the vineyard of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was stopped on outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horse's bridle, 1600 stadia. There's a whole lot of overwhelming pictures in the book of Revelation, but that one's pretty overwhelming. Amen. Chuck, there's, uh, it's been said that there's over 40 references from the book of Daniel in Revelation. Yes. And of course, number 14, this one coming on the cloud, sitting on his throne, the one like a son of man, and Jesus loved to call himself the Son of Man. But here, it's it's almost a direct quotation from Daniel chapter 7. Yes. Yeah, it's hard to get around that. Uh, there's quite a few commentators who were trying to, mainly because they were offended or unclear as to how an angel could be ordering him around. but. If you don't see it as an order, if you see it as more of a release, it's time. Um, then there shouldn't be any contrast there. And like you're saying, Phil, that's such a direct quote from Daniel 7.13 that there's really no reason to think it's any anyone else but. It's just the gardener saying everything looks right. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Go ahead and. The time has come to do what needs done. And and just that beautiful submission, like, I only do what the Father says. That was very much in evidence when he was walking the earth, but that's his eternal state of being, and he's perfectly okay with it. We're the ones who... Uh, get a little uncomfortable thinking of uh, what we only do what somebody else says that but it's a beautiful place of uh, trusting submission and interaction between the three the three and one that goes on there that's far beyond <laughs> any explanation I'm glad he's bigger than our explanations I'm glad yeah. that he's amen more amazing than that i think we can link also this to revelation 19 describing the one coming on the white horse that is it says he was he's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god and he tramples the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god that why are the garments red this isn't the blood of jesus that was shed on calvary but this is the blood of Jesus, or of uh, of judgment, on the robes of Jesus, right? Because he's trampling these grapes. And I think it's always important for me to remember that he is the judge, and he is fair. And if he has decided that this is the 
judgment that's supposed to take place, then it is it is right. Yeah. And like you say, this the people are crying out from the altar for judgment. Right. This, and at the right time it comes. Because this you know, angel is sent from the altar. Uh, I know. Oh, what's this guy's name? John. Anyways, he has a thing about uh, somebody said, why? If God is good, why doesn't he do something about the people that are beheading Christians or, you know, killing their family in front of them and all that? And uh, he says, He's storing up wrath in heaven, basically, to be unleashed at the end. Yeah. <laughs> when he decides that judgment will take place. Um, yeah, he takes no delight in the death of the wicked. So he's he's giving it an amazing amount of time, really, when you think about it. But if you think of him storing up wrath. Right. And then releasing them in the bowls. Yeah. Um, you know, all of the. What sin has done to the earth. Mm. Necessary cleansing. The people of the earth. I think the, uh, there's a question here that comes to mind. So who's doing the trampling? Why? I see the angels are reaping the harvest, but is it not God himself that is doing the trampling? Mm. Well, he would be the only one we would want doing it, right? He's just the perfect, true, and righteous one. The judge. Who would do it in just the right way, just the right amount, just the right time? So, yeah, I would, I would agree. Who is this coming up from Edom? Right? Is that is that the Isaiah quote? Isaiah sixty three. Yes. Why are your garments red? The question is asked. I love that. So Isaiah 63, then we're in. I may as well start in one. Who is this coming up from Edom? In crimson garments from Basra. This one splendid in his apparel, pressing forward in his great might. Question mark. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel so red? And your garments like one who treads in a wine press. I have trodden the wine press alone. From the peoples, no man was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their life blood splattered spattered my garments so i stained all my robes for a day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come i looked but there was no one to help i was amazed but no one was assisting so my own arm won victory for me and my wrath upheld me so i trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath and poured out their lifeblood on the earth Behold the severity and the kindness of God, because the very next part speaks of his kindness, his hesed, his loving kindness. But yes. we can't back away from the righteous, pure, and true judgment that has to cleanse this evil age of death, hell, and the grave. I mean, there's evil things that take place that go on that we do not want transitioning into the next age so 
you are holy, you are righteous, you are true, you are doing a right and good thing. The angels, who have a much better perspective on all this than we do, they've seen generation after generation, and they know what has taken place on the earth that we would have no clue of. And they're the ones proclaiming as loud as they possibly can, you're righteous and true, your judgments are good. You know What you're doing right now is being done perfectly and rightly. Amen. Good. And but for the great scripture, Isaiah, I'm sorry. No, I'm just gonna say. But for the grace of God, we would be thrown in the wine press too. We right. would be trained. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah. It, it just causes us to respond with praise for his mercy. Praise for his mercy. Amen. Well, I was reminded of the scripture in Isaiah. This is 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners this is the one that jesus read in the synagogue in nazareth to proclaim the the year of the lord's favor and jesus stops right there when he's reading the passage out of isaiah because what's the next verse and the day of vengeance of our God. And what separates those two statements? 2,000 years. <laughs> of mercy, of grace. Of there is the day of the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor, his first coming, and the day of vengeance of our God, his second coming. Just a thought. Right. To see the prophet uh, in one in one breath speak of the first and second coming of Jesus. Yeah, so he takes that scroll down and reads it and stops there. <laughs> and you know, if you've got a song memorized, you know what lyrics coming next, and you're starting to say it while the song's going on. And anyone who had this part of Isaiah memorized would have been rolling through their head on what was to come next. And he rolled up the scroll after proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. But there is a part of the gospel message there's coming a day of judgment. He has the right to judge. He has the right to bring this, all these kingdoms to a close and establish his kingdom. And that's the only time things are going to be right. I love what Richie said the other week. Uh, when, when God is on his throne, actually ruling and reigning, finally, you know, there will be a good and righteous, and pure, and true leader and king one that really is through and through good and powerful and it seems like so much of the modern theology wants to take that word perish out of john three sixteen. right but it's there it's part of the message yeah that's right Sin has a cost, a terrible cost. The cross showed us that. He's literally done everything he can do. We're to be proclaiming that, I know. Pete has got a good heart for uh, proclaiming the truth of all this. It's, it's important.
there is a righteous judge and he's coming because he knows it's time and there's there's been an extravagant level of mercy shown as extravagant as that looks like when you say the blood is going to flow for 184 miles as extravagant as that appears mercy has been shown in a far more extravagant way than that amen yes his mercy is everlasting it flows forever right Yeah, maybe that's part of the point that even though this is a great amount of wrath and even though it uh, it has been accomplished and it was necessary, the limitation of 184 miles is a lot smaller than it would have been had he not been constantly working and sending out messengers and making it clear and showing great mercy to every one of us then yeah that could have been a whole lot more but we just have to acknowledge that god you the way you're doing this how you're doing it the timing of what you're doing is perfect You are perfect and your ways are perfect. All your ways are just. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 19. Nice. Yes. I don't know, there's a part of me that would be perfectly willing to stop right now and just have a time of acknowledging who God is and that even even in the midst of what we've read here tonight, there's great faithfulness. And unbelievable overwhelming mercy that is on display fallen fallen babylon the great is fallen all it's been doing this whole time is making people as unaware of him and pulling them away from him and doing all sorts of things that human trafficking and all this other evil that goes on having babylon fall is just and right and pure and true and holy you know so amen lord we're grateful for the incredible Yes. Mercy that you're showing, that you're proclaiming that wickedness and, and, and a turning from you and false kingdoms that bring death and destruction, injury and evil. Bringing them to a close, those things that don't acknowledge you, that don't say you're a good and right and pure and true creator who sent his only son, that we should not perish but have eternal life. That the perishing would has to happen to things that would bring in the same stuff that we would have in this evil age. If you let that go through to the next age, 
then what, what's the difference? There has to be a winnowing. There has to be a, a sifting. There has to be a separating of wheat from tares. So we're just grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your wisdom and your knowledge. And for who you are and for the perfect timing that you're choosing. Keep us in that place of rest and keep us in that place of grace filled perseverance when yes. times speed up in a very hard way. And make us faithful and true to the true message. You've got to turn from, from things that he's told you you have to turn from. He's given you a conscience. He's spoken to you by his spirit. There are things that you know you need to turn from. Yes. Turn from them. Turn to the living God. Receive the mercy that's still being shown. Yes. Thank you, Lord. How unsearchable are your judgments, O oh Lord? Your ways past finding out, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for just making things clearer and clearer and clearer. You will make clear. Yes, Lord. And it will become more and more clear as the day approaches. This is this is me, these this is my way, and this is Babylon. This is that kingdom. You'll you'll in your mercy you'll make it clear. In your mercy you'll be crying out and calling out. Turn. Turn from your evil ways and come back. Come to me. Yes.
pray you give us clarity, Lord, when whenever there's a fear-driven message being put out there about the mark and taking it by accident. Do you give us clarity and an ability to speak directly to that? Full verses right from this chapter that that speak of no, it, it won't be an accident. It won't be a, a whoopsie or a hidden thing. It'll be an intentional thing. Just help us to take away false fears yes. that, that lead to a dependence on certain people and their way of understanding certain things. Help us to speak a clear message. A clear call, a clear trumpet call. Amen. Thanks for coming along for all this because it gets very intense from here on out and there's a whole lot of uh, the bulls and the, the looking at Babylon. It's going to be intense, but I'm glad we're doing it together. I'm glad we're working our way through it verse by verse. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Well, I know I'm letting people out early, but it feels like <laughs> feels like we're okay. You know, as we were praying, Chuck, I thought of that one verse that uh, says, "Whoever will fall against this rock will be broken, mm. but on whomsoever this rock shall fall will be." crushed to powder and it, it's like i felt the lord's invitation to come and fall against him Amen. against the rock to repent and be broken now we're going to be broken either way right the other way we can do it voluntarily now coming and falling against the rock or the rock is going to come and crush but uh Two different uh, crushings, two different uh, stages of brokenness. Anyhow, that came to me as we were praying. Yeah, yeah. This time of a wide open door of mercy is truly amazing. Truly yeah. grateful for this this period of time. Amen. All right. Good night, friends. Amen. Bless you. Good night. Good night, all. God bless Good night. you. Good night, everyone. Good night.